good afternoon, friends. It's a pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Rajiv Malhotra. Uh, in fact, he had addressed us all last year at, as the keynote speaker at the Valley of Earth. And it's a great honor for us that he's today talking to us about his new book, which is Five Battlegrounds. And we are delighted uh, that this is the first festival where this book will be, will be discussed because it's just going to come. And we are very privileged uh, that, that we have the honor of being the first literature festival in the world uh, to have a discussion on this book. Thank you very much for giving us this honor, uh, Mr. Malhotra. Uh, now, you know, uh, a brief introduction. Uh, he's an alumnus of St. Columbus, St. Stephen's, went to America in 1971, has worked across uh, the across various sectors, especially the, the, the computer IT fields. And then he set up the Infinity Foundation because he wanted to connect uh, the Indic thought, Indic philosophy, and give it in a manner in which the West would understand it and in a manner in which we can continue our dialogues in a manner which are equal. And that's why his first book was Being Different. He's written a series of books, including Sanskrit Non-Translatable, which, and I often quote uh, from those books in my lectures. It's really wonderful, and I'm sure uh, many of you would have read more, uh, many of you will have been inspired to read more of Rajiv Malhotra after our discussion today. Uh, so let me start uh, by asking uh, you, uh, Rajiv, that Last year, you delivered the uh, keynote address and its impact on India. And now you've turned this into a book. Uh, can you, you know, tell us about uh, the main uh, thesis or the main hypothesis on which you've uh, developed this book? Yes. Well, thank you very much for having me back. Uh, last year, I gave the first ever public address on this subject of the artificial intelligence impact on society. Uh, and that was in 2019 at your uh, your conference, which uh, your literary festival. Uh, and you know, it's a book I've been working on for several years. My original background is in physics and computer science. As a computer scientist, my subject was artificial intelligence. But 50 years ago, it was a very embryonic field, not like it is today. I've kept a intellectual interest. I'm not uh, actively involved in, in in practicing artificial intelligence. I'm more concerned about its social implications, which are considerable. So I put all this together into this new book, uh, the you know artificial intelligence and the future of power, because I think it will affect power in a big way. So there are five battlegrounds. Uh, one is the economic power, industry, jobs, that uh, you know education, that whole side. Uh, is going to be disrupted. There will be new haves and have-nots. Uh, those who cannot keep up with it will be left behind. Those who are into this new AI-oriented things will leapfrog ahead. The second battleground is uh, geopolitics. Uh, geopolitics is uh, the battleground where uh, China is dominating. There's a lot of uh, US-China debates and fights going on, and I, my book discusses that. And the question is, where is India? And is India in trouble? And in some ways, it is left behind. Uh, the third battleground is psychology, uh, your, your agency, who controls your choices. Is the social media making us dumber while the machines are getting smarter? And the machines are able to influence our thinking, our choice making, not only what we buy, but how we vote, uh, you know, what movie we watch, things like that. More and more behavior is being controlled by machines, and people are becoming dependent on them. So I, I refer to them as Google, Devta. Facebook Devata, these are the new Devatas that we all sort of bow down to and we want to be in the good books of these social media type of uh, platforms so that we feel empowered, we feel prestigious and all that. That's the third one. The fourth battleground is, you know, loss of selfhood, the, the battle for selfhood, because there is an artificial uh, in, intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality and implants, implants in the brain coming. Mm -hmm. which is going to in, which is going to give us the desires the joys the the sorrows so it will be artificial joys artificial desires artificial sorrows artificial uh, uh, artificial uh, high artificial uh, sense of enlightenment even some artificial enlightenment which is not really authentic so we're becoming kind of artificial people so as we become more artificial people what does it do to us as a you know, real the a real spiritual being uh, we are, are we becoming more matter, more materialistic, more biological and silicon? Uh, that's the fourth battlefield. The fifth one is what will all this do to India? And that's the part two of the book. Part one is the first four battlefields. Part two is the uh, battle for India. 
and I'm not uh, take, I'm not giving an easy, uh, you know, happy story. I'm giving challenges that India must face. These are serious challenges. Uh, what, how the military has to face, the economy has to face, the education ministry has to face. Uh, you know, in every uh, dimension that I have looked at, India is five to ten years behind U.S. and China, and this China taking over AI and using AI to weaponize itself is going to ex be exported into Pakistan. So China, China will use foot, foot soldiers of Pakistan. Pakistan will become more and more dependent and a digital colony of China. Uh, China has already put in a whole lot of uh, surveillance systems in Pakistan along that corridor they have, and they're doing facial recognition and they're keeping track of what where things are go moving, what's going on in Pakistan. China has already done that with Africa turned it into a virtual colony, many countries like Zimbabwe. So China is using AI and surveillance and psychological manipulation, information manipulation as a way to kind of colonize various countries, Pakistan being a primary, uh, one of the primary ones. This is worrisome for India. And I did not find enough Indians thinking about it. I did not find uh, political people or I think the, the segment of Indians that are most in tune with my concerns are the military people. I think they really understand all this, but I think that the civilian side, academic people, industry people, economists, I'm not sure they really take the seriousness that AI deserves. So that's what this book is about. No, thank you very much. But I must uh, mention here that uh, uh, I think the, the, the IAS and the senior levels in the government, uh, some of my colleagues, especially in the Tamil Nadu e-governance agency, uh, and also in Madhya Pradesh and in uh, Uttarakhand and in several states uh, and also the ego platform, the, the national ego mission, they are looking at AI. Uh, maybe we've not been very vocal about it, uh, but uh, especially in terms of blockchain, especially in terms of now the crisis that we had uh, about, you know, the migration of people. So we are now, this challenge itself has got us to think of this, but but don't uh, think that I'm only always defending the government. You are right that there are several challenges that we face. And uh, in fact, uh, you could also throw some light on, on, on how this particular disruption uh, of AI is going to be different from uh, uh, the previous disruption that we've had whenever there's been a change in technology. You see, because whenever there's a change in technology, no, this is... we moved, uh, whether it was the Green yeah. Revolution or whatever thing. So, so how is this AI uh, disruption going to be different both in terms of scale, in terms of scope, uh, and in terms of the very conception of it. Now, that's a very important point. Uh, people often cite, and I disagree with that view, that in the previous uh, you know, industrial revolutions, uh, the industry created more jobs than it destroyed. So when people move from farms to factories, they lost the farming jobs, but the factories created more jobs. That is true. It all happened. And therefore, they're saying in AI, we shouldn't worry because it'll create more jobs. I think we should worry for the following reason. When the Industrial Revolution happened in England, the jobs created were in England, the jobs lost were in India. We became a colony as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution impact was unequal. It made the, some people very strong, like in Britain, and it made the people of India dependent and colonized. So even though AI will have a big impact it may not be, it will not be an equal impact. Some people will become digital colonizers and some people will become digital colonies. So the impact will be there, even though new jobs are created, they will not be in the same place as the jobs that are lost. Take driverless cars. Driverless cars may create, uh, you know, some jobs for Tesla, factory in China, they have factory in US. But what about the 20, 30, 40 million drivers all over the world who lose their jobs? The loss of jobs will be all over the place the new jobs created will be in a concentrated area. So Bangalore may create jobs because of AI, but maybe Bihar and Orissa and UP, a lot of the other places will lose jobs. So the, the asymmetric and unequal impact will, will create social disruption. Also, uh, when you look at previous revolutions, the revolution happened over multiple generations. The, the industrial revolution, uh, you know, people in the farms, uh, were no, it was no longer viable to be a farmer because there were machines taking over and the son of that farmer would get a job in a factory. But it happened slowly so that the old farmer could continue being a farmer for the rest of his life. It's the next generation that got, the, got into the factory. In the case of AI, if you are 30-something, 40-something, 
the disruption is so quick that if you if you lost your job uh, you know you are still in the middle of your career it's not that it will take 10 years to make the job obsolete it'll happen overnight like take take a look at uber how quickly it de- destroyed uh, you know taxi business in many countries take a look at itunes it destroyed the whole record industry uh, take a look at uh, self publishing and online publishing and and, and amazon uh, it destroyed retail industry so the the disruption that ai is bringing is so fast that people who are caught in the old economy in the middle of their careers uh, are, are, it, they don't have the luxury to say well my son will benefit from this new technology but for me i will continue life as usual what happens to the people in the middle career who suddenly are disrupted so i can go on but in my book i argue that the ai technology because of its scale because of its speed uh, because just the the way it it is so powerful uh, is not going to be uh, an easy thing to manage like the previous industrial revolutions were uh well uh, let me just give you uh, uh, a different view point uh, take the case of literature festivals or publishing industry you know i find that of course there are lots and lots of self published authors who are coming up but that is not changing the uh, the, the model of uh, of the established book industry because there's a professional side to it and there's an amateur side to it i mean for instance like you know i mean the, the publishers that we deal with rupa hashet you know papa collins and penguins of the world jagernauts nothing is happening to them yes of course a lot of others are also coming up so i i don't know whether it will have this impact but that's of course a matter of debate and and uh, our, our, uh, but but you do make a point uh, but let, let's see how it turns out uh, so uh, can you give me because i am very upbeat about about india and about our ability to do things maybe because i only listen to the positive news around me and uh, you know you being a bit distant you can look at things more critically and more analytically uh, so can you give me some specific examples of what you think is wrong with our ai policy okay uh, very good uh, you know india indians are among the largest group of people who are ai experts around the world but they are not mm-hmm. working for india you go around the world whether it's the us defense contractors whether it's private sector whether it's academics even chinese companies uh, european companies you'll find indians at the top in so many places but india has not been able to create a policy to harness the brains of its own ai type of people so uh, very small this even niti ayog's reports mentions this they all go overseas the small percentage of the top brains that stay in india end up working for microsoft india or google india they're working for american companies india subsidiaries rather than work, work, uh, rather than for part of the make in india kind of a thing and so india is exporting raw labor and this raw labor creates assets intellectual property for foreign enterprises and then india imports it back uh, it, you know th- this is how google became so big and this is how facebook became so big and then we get a small amount of their wealth back and we sell them our equity in jio so basically we are selling brains they are creating the equity then they are using that equity to buy us out so this is a very bad policy this is a this is a wrong policy i think we we have not been able to harness brains in order to create our own intellectual property and in this book i fault the people who did outsourcing because they took the brains they did labor arbitrage they would hire somebody for $10000 a year and market him for 30000 make good money and a lot of people became billionaires overnight and we celebrate them i don't think that uh, they serve the country because they should have plowed that profit back to build products and technology that is made in india rather than the easy money to sell their labor at a at a markup so this business of becoming uh, you know i call it tech coolies supplying this labor force to the world uh, as a matter of pride and all that uh, is short term you know you got to get started by doing this but at this at the same time once you have money coming in you have to reinvest the money for the for nation building in a very serious way you know all these rafael jets we are buying all kind of military stuff we are buying the what makes them brilliant what makes them great is the ai it's they've got so much ai in built into these things and indians are working in all those places developing that ai and then we buy it back for a huge amount of money this is not sustainable india cannot go on surviving india's sovereignty cannot continue uh, based on foreign weapons to protect ourselves uh, we have to and we are selling lot of raw, raw labor uh, making some foreign exchange 
and then we are using this foreign exchange to buy back the, uh, part, uh, from some of that technology uh, that our own people have built. This is a this is something the government has to government and the private sector have to really take a serious look at this whole model of uh, how to use Indian brains in this way. I think you make a very substantial point, and I think uh, uh, maybe we should devote much more time to it in our next festival. We should actually, you know, curate a discussion around this and how uh, we need to we need to not just leverage Indian brains. Uh, uh, for getting jobs for themselves, but in order to develop our own capacities. And I think uh, that's the same point yes. which the Prime Minister is also making. And, and I think after listening to you, things do get into a little perspective because while we have done, uh, and, and I would I really now see the sense of what you're saying that what you've done is good, but what we could have done could have been much greater. So we are sort of compromising ourselves at, at you know, 5 on 10, whereas we should actually be 9.5 on 10 on why not 10 on 10 so we're just being satisfied so with, think, with the base yeah you know yeah. so yeah. we should not yeah. be so satisfied to continue yeah no. would have you know yeah this is very good I'm, I'm very good point so 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 to continue this point china also started by exporting factory labor which was cheaper than american factory labor so they could sell uh, make money on selling cheap labor but the chinese took between 25% and 50% of all the profits and invested into futurist technologies. And so they created Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Hawaii, all these kind of companies, which are now, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth. They're big. These companies are bigger than Tata's. They're bigger than the market capitalization of Reliance. So these companies are like 10 years old in terms of the, the, the growth. They might have existed before as small companies. What China did is they said, on the one hand, we'll have an economy selling cheap labor to the Americans, but then we'll take all this profit that we are getting and we're going to create technology of our own, which will leapfrog ahead of the Americans. And they put a ban on Facebook in China, Google, Amazon to create a market for the local people and said, OK, now you become the trillion dollar companies, Chinese companies, and then you go around the world. And that's how we will become a great power. India didn't do that. India did only the first part which is to uh, uh, you know, export raw labor at a markup. But then what happened? Those a few people who were big industrialists made tons of money and we celebrated, celebrate them as, you know, wow, they are great guys because they made so much money. But that money was private money. It was not plowed into nation building. I think I, that's a very, very valid point. And, uh, but I think it also means that along with this, we need to have a meta narrative about a nation. You see, we need to have a yes. meta narrative about a nation which is which has to extend beyond the political class. It's a meta narrative that you and I must believe in. It's a meta narrative which the kids who are now in tenth and eleventh and twelfth, and and those who are now in Kendra Vidyala in government schools, they must own this narrative. They must own this meta narrative of a new India. Uh, so I'm glad that yes. that you know we and I hope that we are reaching out to uh, to children and to and to young students across the country. Uh, and the good thing is that because it's a it's a recorded in an archive sessions, I, I we will try to you know share it with most of the schools in the country. Uh, now you know you mentioned uh, something called the crash of civilizations, as against what we hear yes. clash of civilizations. And this is going to be my last question because we are running out of time. Uh, so please elaborate on this uh, on this new twist that you've given from clash to crash. Okay, so. One of the things I mentioned for the first time in public in your uh, 2019 festival in my talk was I did not use this term, but I said that uh, in the future, because of AI, uh, instead of uh, 10 billion population, uh, maybe 1 billion people will be enough to do the work because of robotics, because of automation, because, uh, you know, automated surgery, uh, automated farming, so many things that machines can do better than us. So if they, if that is the case, then, you know, we'll have a whole lot of surplus people because you could say, let's look after these surplus people with augmented reality, virtual reality. They'll sit at home, they'll enjoy life. They'll have robots as servants and everybody will be happy. But then you know, the world, the way capitalism works is very selfish. People who are the owners of this technology, who have a concentration of power and wealth, a lot of trillionaires will emerge. So there will be a pyramid of wealth, a pyramid of power. And people who are at the lower end 
uh, they will not be needed because those kind of jobs, it will be like people are useless. We are, why are we needing them? Why do we want to spend money housing them and subsidizing them? And it's like a overpopulated world. So I feel that the civilization will face the dilemma that we have far too many people than we need. And this will the, having fewer people, maybe through birth control, maybe through policies of whatever kind, and maybe it will take 50 years to gradually gen, in a very gentle way, reduce the population. That will not go easy. That will not go easy. It's not like everybody will volunteer and say, okay, you know, for the next 50 years, we just automatically lower the population. This will shift world power in a way that there will be tremendous violence, tremendous violence within countries, tremendous violence between countries. Uh, and I think the concept of what we think of as civilization is going to be hampered. There will be a kind of new brutality. I use the term depopulation in my talk at the 2019 festival. I use the word mm -hmm. depopulation that the world could face the, uh, the that the topic of depopulation will become okay to talk about. That maybe there's just too many of us and we are extending the lifespan. And as we extend the lifespan using these technologies, the population is going to also remain larger because there's more people, they live longer. And so uh, 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 we, can, we can augment them with all kinds of devices to make them healthier, happier, but why do we need so many people? We, well, the world's work can be done with fewer people. So this idea of depopulation, I think, has to be discussed at some point in time. It will be particularly traumatic for overpopulated countries. It will be very traumatic for India because, you know, quite honestly, with, with enough technology, instead of 1.3 billion people, for you could run India with 400, 500 million people and have a wonderful country. And you won't have to get housing and food and... Uh, you know, all kind of facilities for the bottom half. But it is not humane to say, okay, let's get rid of them. It is a dilemma. And I think that's the crash of civilization where uh, we have to figure out a good humanitarian, acceptable way uh, to, to kind of bring the population down. The population has gone way too high in the past 100 years. And, and uh, uh, bringing it down may take a very long time. So that's the crash of civilization. But is this not... Uh it, it's a very refined Malthusian argument, you know, and, and this clash between the Malthusians and the Prometheans has always been there. So, uh, so let's see how it pans out. I do see the, but at the same time, I would also mention, you see that uh, that China, you certainly going to have lesser population, right? That's that's the trend that's happening. Yes. There. Within India, you say it's yes. like Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Punjab, where the population is stabilized or becoming less. Uh, in fact, uh, the one uh, other aspect of this is the, the very high growth of urbanization um, and uh, service related industries and things. But, but of course, there is a lot of merit in your argument and that's what makes the book interesting. You know, that's what will make the book uh, make us all think and uh, being able to think uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. And uh, therefore we look forward to an absolutely, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure all the readers would like to pick up a copy. And uh, we look forward to reading it, to, to discussing it even more. And more power to your pen, more power to your thoughts. And we hope to see you in actual person in the 2021 edition of Value of Words, wherever we hold it. Thank you so much, Rajivji, for joining us on the session. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the next opportunity. And I would really like to be there in person and enjoy your hospitality one more time. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.